So our program today is maintaining a Florida native yard and Netta Villalobos Bell is our presenter. Uh, we wanna welcome her back. Um, those of you who've been attending passion flower programs for a while will remember that she did a program in September of 2019 that was very engaging. Her presentation was Florida Habitats and Their Native Plants. Um, Netta was a UF IFAS Master Gardener for 11 years. Currently, she's a certified Advanced Florida match Master Naturalist and Land Steward, a certified horticultural professional, and a certified National Association interpreter. She's a longtime member of the Florida Native Plant Society, a past president of the Couplet Firm chapter in Seminole County, and a current board member for the Lake Beautyberry chapter. Her yard has been on a Master Gardeners and Statewide Native Plant Society tour and was featured in an Orange County government TV series, Wildlife Matters, to promote the benefits of gardening for wildlife. In 2018, she was recognized as the Cox Conservation Hero for Central Florida. Her goal is to help people recognize, appreciate, and protect Florida's natural resources and wildlife. And her favorite pastime is gardening with Florida native plants for the benefit of native wildlife. She has tr transitioned her two previous home yards from traditional to native and is currently working on her third yard. So Netta, if you would... Um, start your presentation. You uh, just need to share your screen. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Melanie, for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure. Um, to talk to native plant uh, interested people. And um, I'm, a, uh, as you know, I'm a Florida native plant person um, and belong, have belonged to the society for a very long time. <clears throat> I do have a goal um, for this presentation and that is to offer some suggestions um, to minimize um, your maintenance with native plants and to encourage planning space for wildlife, of course, and to promote a positive neighbor, neighborhood um, perception of what native plants can look like. So the agenda today, uh, there's many different reasons why people plant native plants and there could be very different um, ways of arranging this presentation today but this is what i came up with um, because i believe that all three of these can be um, help you minimize your um, maintenance in the future so i'll be talking about each of these individually uh, with sub um, topics the first one um, topic is prevention. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can prevent future maintenance. And starting with our HOA rules, uh, there was a UF study in neighborhoods um, and the result was that the neighborhood thought that native plants were wild looking. Okay, that's why they don't want them. And the neighbors and the HOA board thought that um, they wanted their yards, everybody's yards in the neighborhood, to look attractive so that it would maintain or increase their property values. So I can say two things to this. Number one is that most people don't even know what a native plant is, okay? Because 
non-native plants can look messy too, right? If they're not maintained. So um, when you put in a native plant, actually people really don't know. You can just slip them in, slip them in there, add them, and people won't even know. They'll just think it's a beautiful plant. It is important to maintain them so that they have that, that um, perception. And to make them look less wild, um, in addition to maintaining them, there are other things you can do, like add borders. Here's a, a, a small area of grass. You can use um, little fences. You can add bird baths. You can make it look very attractive. So even if, as I mentioned, um, you think that you can plant anything you want because of a Florida friendly um, ordinance that was passed, you still do have to go through your HOA for approval. So as I mentioned, there's different um, regulations for different or, um, neighborhoods and uh, you can just find out how you can work through that and get their approval. Um, and if you're in, not in an, an, an HOA like I am now, well, you still need to look good <laughs> because what we all wanna do is not just look at our own yard, but help promote native plants uh, throughout. Uh, the first thing you want to look at is invasive plants, and some of these may look familiar to you, even in your neighbor's yards. Uh, they probably don't know that they're invasive, um, but the first thing to do is, if they're in your yard, to know what they are and get rid of them. Another plant that's not here that um, seems to be very popular is lantana. And there's one that's especially um, invasive, aggressive, uh, Lantana camara. But unfortunately, there's like a hundred different cultivars of that thing. You can't really pin it down. Um, most of them have all these kind of crazy, wild, pretty colors. Whereas our natives, um, there's a couple that are available um, at the native nurseries. One of them is um, button sage, which has white flowers with a little uh, yellow center in it. It's more of a coastal plant, actually. And then the other one is a depressa, which is pineland. And that one uh, is from primarily Dade County, but you can still plant it. Um, there are, I put it in my yard and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, there are some people, native plant people, who feel that you should not um, bring in plants from other parts of the state, that they're not um, part of the natural area where we're at. But, you know, there are always different viewpoints on everything. So that's up to you. Um, to know what your native, in, excuse me, non-native invasive plants are, um, there are very different resources for those to check on that. But I would recommend the, using the FLEPSI one, F-L-E-P-P-C. Uh, you can see the website down there, or excuse me, up there on the left-hand side. Um, all these organizations use different criteria. FLEPSI, is made up, uh, their committee council is made up of a lot of different um, state, federal agencies and um, experts, consultants, expert consultants. And they review the list every couple of years. Uh, the last list was 2019. So we should be coming out with another one soon. But I like their criteria. They divide the invasive plants up into two categories, category one, category two. Category one simply means that um, it, this, the plant, this non-native plant has altered the ecosystem, um, possibly wiping out or um, 
eliminating our natives or they're taking over and our natives are diminishing. Um, they could be um, crossbreeding um, or they change the structure of the ecosystem. So these have been documented to negatively affect our native plants in natural areas, not your yard, but how do they get into the natural areas? It's because a lot of these plants um, are somehow brought in, maybe by the wind, maybe by bird droppings, maybe there's some uh, <clears throat> something attached to you know a seed or something on you and you carry it around with you. So um, as I mentioned, I think this is a good list. You may not recognize all the plants because it does give the common name as well as the scientific name, but uh, just a resource for you to um, peruse. Now, also important before you start anything in prevention, preventing uh, future maintenance, is putting the right plant in the right place. And if you don't know more about the plant that you're buying, if you just go in and you just are um, enamored with what a plant looks like uh, superficially, you could bring it home and it may not be appropriate for your yard, depending on what its characteristics and, and cultural needs are. And if the plant dies then, then your expectations, your, your realistic expectations are not met and you could you know, result in frustration and maybe think that you don't want to use any more plants that are native. It could discourage some people. So be sure and um, read up on all these different plant characteristics and where you're going to put it. Another thing is to consider um, many vines will be deciduous, uh, ground covers can be aggressive. Some plants just completely die back like liatris and you may think it's dead. Uh, it will pop back up in the spring or fall. Um, and some plants have suckers, which we'll talk about um, in more in detail later. So check out this list and um, see what you can prevent any further maintenance by having realistic expectations. And of course, as probably many of you know, um, you want to group plants with their cultural needs. So once you know what they need, for example, um, up here on the top right, we have a Coreopsis and down below we have Coreopsis. So there are different species of this. So you can't, it's, it's, it's important to know what the species of the genus is. It will help you uh, further define what the plant needs. One of these plants, uh, the top plant likes it a little bit more wet, whereas the bottom plant likes it a little bit drier. And up on the top, um, pro providing like uh, rainwater runoff, having, um, I want to call this like a rain garden, perhaps. It's not really a rain garden per se, maybe a rain catchment. Um, anyway, you have to make sure that you have the right uh, plants there. Also, um, there's a great book for uh, plants in the shady landscape. Uh, just a shout out to Greg Hegel. He makes wonderful uh, he has a lot of wonderful books, and I like his style because he doesn't just list the properties or features of a plant. He um, has a more, um, how do you say, his communication is like he's talking to you. So it's fascinating reading. Very uh, good. He's also a gardener, so that really helps. However, I'll say a word here too. When you look at these different references for um, plant features and habits and culture, you want to make sure that you use a Florida um, authored book. And there again, depending on where the author is, for example, um, 
um, Osorio is in the South Florida, whereas Craig is on uh, the Gulf side. You may have somebody from uh, the Panhandle area. So their experiences might be different and you may find, as I have, you'll read uh, perhaps a height is from six to 10 feet and then you read somewhere else that it can go 20 to 30 feet. So you kind of have to maybe play the middle ground here, plus even putting it in your yard compared to putting it in your neighbor's yard or your friend's yard can have different results in how that plant grows. So you kind of have to be a little flexible with that. Um, when I say uh, locally sourced plants, some, uh, if you go like to big box stores, they will get their plants. They do have some native plants sometimes, but they get their source from somewhere out of state. Uh, one example is when uh, FDOT was using flocks to put on the roadsides for wildflowers, uh, they got it from Texas. And um, lo and behold, they are sterile. So they never receded, so they spent all that money and then their plants didn't come back um, the next spring or the next fall when they um, planted them out first. Now, also there's um, red maple. Well, you can get like seedlings or whatever, order them online, maybe from up north and it's the same genus and species However, if you bring that plant down here, it will not do as well, even though it's the same genus and species because it was grown and it adapted, just like our plants have adapted to Florida. Their plants are adapted to Michigan, colder weather, different soil types. So be aware of that. Even when you go to a native uh, plant nursery, you wanna perhaps ask them where they get their plants. And remember, you put a plant in, but your landscape changes, doesn't it? Things grow. So don't be surprised. And uh, again, you can see here that uh, this is a ground cover, uh, sunshine mimosa, and it spreads all over. Another thing with ground covers is you have to be very diligent when they're first growing because it can get weeds and grass in there, you know. Uh, the grass seeds can blow in and start growing, and then they are so hard to remove. But you have to be diligent about that. Don't be surprised uh, when that happens. Now, I will say that you may have a planned strategy here of putting something in temporarily. Um, what I'm thinking of is you put a tree in and you know, it's not a big tree, it hasn't really grown. So it looks kind of bare around there. So you are gonna put in plants in the sun, knowing that as the tree grows, that plant doesn't want shade, but you've put something in there as a placeholder, something to kind of fill the space. The same can be done with kunti. Kunti, I see a lot of kuntis that are, planted too close to each other, uh, not real, not planting for the mature size. And, but again, you've got all this bare space in there. Um, so you might put in some flowers, some flowering uh, perennials until the cooties grow in and then you don't care about the uh, perennials that die back because that was your strategy. You knew what you were doing. Um, it's important to add diversity to a landscape, uh, primarily for the health of the plants, for looking good, and for, of course, wildlife. But when you have too much, now when I first looked at this, I'm going, wow, that's great. Look at the colors and the textures. and Oh, I just love that. And then when I look closer, I go, oh my gosh, that's a lot of maintenance, isn't it? Look how that vine is growing. The coral honeysuckle is growing all over. And what happens when those perennials die back? Are you going to go in there and deadhead them all the time or cut them all back? So this is great um, if it's something that you have time 
energy and a passion for. So if you do, and it's okay. Reducing lawn. Uh, I think everybody here knows about um, the upkeep on, on lawn. Certainly, um, I think it's a time saver. You can just zip up and down with the mower or you have somebody come up. Uh, you hire somebody to come, come in and just mow it down. However, if you want a nice looking lawn, most people are gonna be using fertilizers and pesticides to keep it looking healthy and green. So to reduce that type of maintenance, um, you can just do reduce lawn gradually. And you do that by, you know, most people when you've got a, a bed, a, a shrub bed or whatever, when that plant in the bed starts growing towards the grass, what do they do? They prune the shrub back. Well, what you can do is just increase the bed into the lawn, maybe, maybe at least a foot, a foot or two. And then the next time the shrub grows bigger, you reduce the lawn even more. So eventually it looks like what the bottom slide is. You can see the plants, the big shrubs on the left-hand side that used to be way back and now they've moved forward. Having a, a traditional uh, yard in the front is preferable to, um, how can I say, having something, I would prefer having something more natural in the backyard for a couple different reasons. Number one, um, we, we can help the perception of what native plants are by providing something that looks a little bit more controlled. It doesn't mean you have to have balls and squares on shrubs. It just needs, just means um, that you need to be a little bit more maintained. You can still reduce the grass, put in uh, pathways, uh, bird baths, all that kind of thing. But when you put your perennials in the backyard, which need a lot more maintenance than shrubs and trees, this allows you to defer maintenance. For example, if you go away on vacation for a couple of weeks and you don't get to all those dead flowers or scraggly kind of or branches that need to be cut back. No one's gonna see them except you when you get back and you've got time to maintain what's there. Hedges um, are, can be a maintenance reduced um, job. And, but what you want to do is you want to consider these different um, strategies here. And I already knew some of these, of course, we all do, uh, but I took most of them from uh, Ginny Steibalt step-by-step uh, -step guide. It's down there at the bottom. Of course, we mentioned uh, cultural needs. You're choosing your plants. You want to use at least three different species. In landscape design, you use odd numbers to plant. And for some reason, I'm not sure, I'm not a, a psychiatrist or psychiatrist, psychologist, but there have been studies, you know, people respond to odd numbers instead of something that's in a straight line. Although there are some people who do like little um, straight lines with the same species. However, for maintenance, you want to group in, in different, um, different species. And the reason for that is if you've got a disease or a pest that is specific to one plant, it could go right down your line and kill all your plants. Whereas if you've got different species, at least you can um, save part of your hedge there. And of course, staggering the plants makes it look more attractive also and consider different um, features of the plant and include different textures.
And just like you've heard, it's good to have a breakfast to start your day. Uh, it's healthy. It's also healthier to give your plant a new start healthy in your, in your, um, your yard. They're coming out of a pot and you know they're just going into this foreign place here. So you gotta treat it um, correctly. And the first thing you do is when you take it out of the pot, look at all those girdling roots. Um, we probably can all have stories about those. I've had some where the big roots just wrapped around and I couldn't even use it, you know, because I cut off so many roots, it, it just was not going to survive. Um, but if you can, try to pull out, untangle, um, tease the roots out. Even if there's not girdling roots like this, tease the little roots that are starting to grow out from the plant and make sure that they want to spread out when you put them in the plant. Um, if it becomes too much to um, move these heavier roots out, you can take a slit, um, take a sharp uh, implement and just slit it down maybe four sides of the um, potted plant there. Then when you dig your hole, you can see that the bottom of the root ball is placed on the bottom of the hole. And the top of the root ball is a little bit ab above the soil line. This is for Florida um, because we have more sandy soils than other states. Um, this allows for any settlement um, into the ground. So you want it a little bit above the ground. You want to see the flare on the trunk or the stem of the plant. Don't let any of those top roots show, but make sure um, that the root ball's a little bit above. And so fill the hole first with water. Let it drain. This is kind of two tests for you. Number one, if you fill the hole, and I've done this, and it can change within your yard, different locations, you fill it with water, and it's like three hours later, it hasn't drained. Hmm, something's going on there. And perhaps if you've got a plant that you thought would do well there in a dry soil, you're going to have to change your strategy and put one in that likes more water. Also, um, when you water it, it will percolate a little bit out to the sides. So when you put the plant in the hole, it will gravitate towards that water that's on, uh, surrounding it in the other soil that you've put back, the um, backfill soil that you dug the hole out with. So you want to layer that too. Uh, to make sure there's no air pockets, put it back in, water it, put it back in, water it. And um, when you irrigate it afterwards, make sure you're watering the root ball, not um, way out away from it, like with the irrigation system that comes out overhead and waters your whole planting bed. But make sure you're watering the root ball that gets enough water. And then as the plant grows, its roots spread out, you can move that watering device a little bit further out where the roots are, are growing. And you don't want too much mulch, especially up against the trunk of a tree piled up there or against the stem of a, a herbaceous plant because too much moisture can cause um, rot, stem and root rot. A lot of work, huh? I never thought you had to put all that into just putting the plant in the ground. And planting away from the house. Um, shrubs should, you know what the diameter is from one side of the plant to the other, it's the width. And so you take half that plant and give it that amount of space from the building. What that does is you don't have to go behind and prune like this. The other thing is when you've planted further away from the house, it's going to allow air circulation through the plant so that if it does get watered, 
uh, from above, you're not going to create a situation for fungus. And by planting further away, if you have to do any uh, window washing there, or you want to do any repairs to the house, or maybe you're just repainting the whole house, you've got um, movement air, uh, a movement space that back, back there for you. And speaking of mulch, or speaking away from the house, um, again, by piling up mulch moisture, whether it's rocks or any kind of mulch, um, it, can har it can harbor termites because they, they gravitate toward moisture. So keep it away from the house. And trees away from the house. Um, trees have spreading roots that can go two to three times the canopy of the tree from the drip line, okay? So from that drip line of the canopy, think about how much further your roots can extend. And that's where you wanna to water too, is out there. You don't need to water real close to the tree. Now in Florida, most tree roots there are some that have tap roots. Of course, we know that like the pines, but most trees only grow down to a depth of one to two feet. So um, when you're planting something else, make sure that you're not cutting off or if you're adding them, um, say for example, a patio or putting in a pool, whatever. Um, just make sure that you understand how uh, trees grow. Okay, this is subject number two, uh, pests and diseases. And you think, why is she covering that in maintenance? Well, how you prune and how you irrigate does make a difference in the health of your plants. If you don't use the right tools or if you prune too much, it can open the plant up to diseases and pests. If you overwater, you can cause rot. Um, and then I'll go over some uh, quick um, clues to identifying diseases and insects on your plants and how to take care of that. Let's do, um, let's do a oh. <laughs> Hi there. Hi there. Go ahead. <clears throat> so everyone who answered said yes, pruning can affect the health of the plant. Aha. Uh -huh. Excellent. Let me get rid of that. Ken, need you. So the next thing here, oh, just a second. I need to get rid of that. What's it say? First disease, we'll just click, start clicking next or down arrow. What does that say down there? I can't see it. Show results. I just, where's your, where's your cursor? Oh, okay. Oh, there's a cursor on the screen. Interesting is that. Reloaded. Okay. Uh, let oh, me, let me go and talk. It may have disconnected you. Hello? Yes. Oh yeah, they're there. Okay. Can you still see the screen, uh, the poll on the screen? No. Oh, good. Okay, I'll just. Um, so anyway, pruning. Pruning tools are um, very important uh, to use. You, instead of right plant, right place, we have right tool, right job. And I'm going to talk specifically about um, bypass and anvil. 
I had a friend who was enamored with anvil pruners because he thought that it really did the job. The problem with anvil is that it smashes. When it, you make a cut, it smashes um, the tissue, which is not healthy. You know, it's not a clean cut and the plant won't be able to, to heal itself properly. So you want to use bypass. You can use anvil for things that are dead, you know, like if you've got a dead branch or you're cutting up branches to put on a, um, um, a brush pile or put out for yard waste. But be sure to use um, bypass. And there's different sizes, as you can see, on the left, the pruners there. Oops, you just changed my slide. Oh, God. Okay. So, um, anyway, then you also have these little uh, pincher ones, which are good for deadheading. You know, the, the big, big, big job one over there um, is it's too big and it's more delicate to use the little. Uh, pruning shears. Also, the uh, loppers, make sure that when you're pruning, um, you use the right, um, how do you say, angles. So when you use those pruning shears, uh, pruners on the left-hand side, the opening between the top and the bottom blade, and you stick it on the branch, and it's too big, you're going to have a hard time cutting it, right? Um, and some of us may have tried to force it, but again, you're not making a clean cut. So then you want to go to a bigger tool, which would be your loppers. And I like these little foldable um, hand saws when even the loppers are not big enough for something uh, that I'm cutting. Now, one of the things when you're pruning, each prune each time you prune is a wound it's an opening in a plant so you want to minimize the number that you do the number of openings on a plant it just encourages diseases and pests to enter it so be thoughtful before you just start whacking away at the plant also if you are pruning a plant that is perhaps diseased um, you should clean your pruning uh, tools prior to going to another plant because um, that bacteria or fungus could be uh, held on the blades and you could transfer that to another plant. Um, probably one of the easiest, and there's all different kinds of solutions that are recommended, but probably the easiest I think is um, just get a um, uh, um, what do you call it, a bottle of uh, rubbing oil, um, isopropyl alcohol, and um, you can just dip your uh, pruners in there and wipe them off, make sure they're very, very dry. Um, but that's just the easiest thing to do. It's just really simple. As far as pruning cuts, um, I won't go over the angles, but you can see where the bud is it could be a bud for a flower or it could be a bud for a leaf but you want to cut it at an angle so and if you cut it straight across or not enough a water can percolate down like when you have over here ir overhead irrigation that kind of thing water can get in there and it can cause some rot and again be an entrance for other pests so make sure that you um, use the proper angle. Also on bigger branches, the reason they show these one, two, three cut is so that if you just, if it's that big of a branch and you cut it beginning at the, the trunk, it's possible that the branch is so heavy, it'll just fall down and rip down the trunk of the tree, another opening that you don't want. So by using one, two, three, it takes a little bit of that extra weight off at the other end, and then you can make its final cut by the trunk. And note that you leave the collar, that little rounded area, that will, when you leave that collar, that's still live material and it will help 
heal the wound that you've made. A lot of times you'll see on a tr uh, the trunk of a tree, you know, where the, the bark has rolled over to cover it. Um, that's where that comes from. Shrubs. Um, number one is people always want things that grow fast. And, but if you plan on um, putting in a slower growing shrub, uh, that minimizes the pruning that you have to do. You know, it just slows it down a little bit. Um, just something to think about. Also, um, when you do have a mature plant, push your arms right down in there, right down into that shrub and clip off any uh, long stems. That helps to make the plant look more natural and it will minimize the number of wounds you're making because you're not shearing it with those electric shear kind of tools. You're not cutting all the leaves off and cutting stubs of extra stems there. So you're making it look more natural and you're minimizing um, the wounds uh, to the plant. Also, you can think about if you um, have a deciduous uh, plant that you want to prune in um, after the leaves are all gone. This really helps you look at the structure of the plant and you can get rid of any um, stems that shouldn't be grow that are growing in the wrong way by doing that. And um, also be sure before you start pruning um, that you're not disturbing any nests in there because there can be a lot of nests in um, plants or shrubs. They use them as nesting spots. And trees, if they're not too big, uh, the homeowner can certainly um, try and prune with the proper tools and with the proper um, cuts. And the things you wanna get rid of are dead, dying, diseased, branches and stems, ones that branches that uh, cross over so that as they grow larger and larger, they start rubbing on one another and then it opens up the space there. So get rid of uh, branches that cross over onto each other. And um, you can give it a, with young trees. It used to be that you didn't want to prune a young tree. However, um, according to university studies, University of Florida studies, it's appropriate to start with a young tree and guide it. Give it a good structure as it grows larger. Again, you're giving it a healthy start. You're not going to take everything away, but to provide for a healthy structure, again, you don't want anything crossing if it's a pro not all trees are like this, but the ones that have um, are supposed to have a, a leader, one from the trunk all the way to the top is the main stem of the tree. You want to make sure that it's um, you don't have two stems or three stems growing from the top, the top. You can cut a couple of them back and make sure the strongest one goes straight up um, and the others are subordinated to it. That will uh, provide a um, good structure in the um, future. So you don't have as much maintenance later. But if you've got a large tree and you've got like major defects or um, major problem, major structural problems, certainly you need to get the experts in there. And I do encourage you to uh, check this website. Um, it's called treesaregood.org. And you can find certified arborists there in your area. Uh, certified arborists have gone through a lot of instruction and experience, and they take a test to be certified. It does not, I'm going to ask you to be a, um, how do you say, informed consumer and still get, you know, at least three bids and recognize that not all arborists are the same because one may have just graduated where another one may have a lot of experience. 
So you do have to do some homework. And what's good about this site is they have many um, publications. You can see there on the left, the tree owner information, uh, choosing the right tree, managing hazards, um, what is it, pruning your trees. If you know some basics about tree pruning, when you interview one of the contractors that comes out, you can ask them questions and see what they say and see if it makes sense. And of course, they're salesmen, so they'll probably all just tell you anything you want to hear. But you need to be um, an informed consumer. And um, so I do recommend um, certified arborist for larger jobs. Okay. Um, suckers, stolen rhizomes, runners. Again, this is something not all, um, how do you say, not all books or online uh, resources will tell you. It's very interesting. That's why I've got so many books. Um, you check one, it gives you a little bit of information. You go somewhere else and you go, aha, this plant is colonial, which means that it can sucker, uh, root sucker. And um, one of the good books that will tell you that kind of thing is a book by uh, Rufi Rufino Osario. Uh, his book on native plants, he has a, a, a section in there called motility. That means how it spreads. So um, I found his, his books to be uh, very helpful in that way where uh, most books won't tell you this. Um, let me think, uh, Craig Hegel's books will sometimes tell you that too. Um, here's some examples like, who knew that Walter's Viburnum um, and Simpson's Stopper are colonial, that they're gonna send out root suckers. Well, I found that out in my yard um, and I, but if you, like I said, if you know, you know, you're putting this in, in the back part of your property and you want to screen, you know, it might be appropriate a choice for you. But again, you want to make sure you, you already know about that. Um, and, and then it would be okay. Now, most plants are capable of suckering, but if they're healthy, they won't. The reason they may is because they may not be healthy. And some of the reasons for that could be that it was planted too deeply. So it's searching for more oxygen, okay? It's searching, sending out its roots. Give me some oxygen where it's um, higher level there. Another thing is if you're pruning too much, if you're doing some heavy pruning, like if it's not appropriate, sometimes it is, depending on the plant. But if you, you know, prune a plant like all the way down to the ground, um, it's going to be stimulated and it could send out suckers. If it's diseased, it may send out suckers. If there's prolonged drought, it may sucker. So the point is, that um, you need to keep your plant healthy, um, plant it healthy, keep an eye on it, and make sure you um, know what you're getting into. So I'm, I'm giving you some, just three examples here of um, plant, you know, perennials that you cut after they flower, you can cut it all the way down, the stem, all the way down to the basal. Uh, flowers that are on the ground. And then there'll be ones that you just deadhead. Okay, so let's go through this quickly. Um, here's some plants. Um, up at the top is Stokes Aster. Once that stem, it's got multiple uh, flowers on it, but once the stem is, uh, once it's done flowering on that stem, just go ahead and cut it all the way back down. Don't try and deadhead it. Just cut it all the way down to the ground. Um, another one is Rayless Sunflower on the uh, left. 
And uh, on the right, we have penstemon. It's the same idea. You've got one stalk with a lot of flowers on it, but once it's done, go ahead and cut the stalk down. Up at the top is conradina. The one I, why I put that in here is because I don't necessarily cut the stalk back, but it seems to have, I've talked to other people, it seems to have a propensity for down at the base is, um, well, the branches will die back. The stems will die back. So you can just get rid of those. They're not doing any, any good there. So pruning the flower heads um, is the tropical sage. Gosh, this is kind of time consuming for me. But what I do is I just, whenever I'm around there, it's not like a scheduled thing. I just walk in the garden. I go, oh, there's some seed heads on there. And so I just take my hand, they're so brittle, you know, you just take your hand and just pinch them down uh, on where all the dead seed head is. And uh, what I've been doing lately is I just throw those seed heads, it's just a bundle, and I throw them in the back of where the, the flowers are, because I know that there are insect eating uh, insects that eat seeds. And also birds, uh, birds will come in and eat seeds. So I just kind of give them a little feeding spot there. Um, also on the top right is uh, Tampa verbena and green eyes that can be uh, deadheaded. And these um, grasses, there's a different, the people, you know, you probably see them on the mediums or mostly in um, um, how do you, commercial places and they just cut them down within, I don't know, maybe six inches, one foot. They do come back, um, but I don't cut mine back because I wanna, I wanna leave those seed heads on there for birds that come in, number one. And so what I do is again, it's not, you know, I might do one mully bush and then maybe a day later or two, whatever. It's just sort of, it's not regularly scheduled, but I go in there when I see uh, the dead uh, stems, you know, around the bottom, I take my hand and I dunk it into the middle of the mully grass and I pull my fingers through and comb out the dead stems. I've never, I tried using that little, um, what do you call it? It's got little claws on it, but for some reason my hands always work better in the yard. Um, but you could try that. I, I actually, it doesn't work for me, but everybody's, um, everybody is different. And then um, you can cut it back, of course, um, maybe every couple years and then let it um, reflush with new growth. Uh, down at the bottom is um, Elliot's Lovegrass, and those seeds, uh, heads, seed heads, will, <laughs> they kind of tumble up and blow all over the yard, so that's its maintenance, just kind of clean those up, um, and then also you can comb that out too, or pull out the dead stems that are at the base. Um, Blue-eyed grass, uh, what I've done with mine is, again, around the perimeter, because it will spread, um, this is an iris, actually, not a grass, but um, it will, the clump will widen out, but there will be dead stems around the bottom. Now, when you have plants like this, the grasses or the blue-eyed grass, this can be a, um, a habitat or a shelter for maybe insects or other little critters. Um, so just be aware of that. But I usually just kind of pull all that dead grass up and around the bottom and uh, kind of keep it tidy and clean that way. Uh, coral honeysuckle um, needs to be tied back because those things will kind of flop around all over. I've known, um, I think it was tried once I saw it in a median where it was on a, as a ground cover and I've seen it recommended this, but I wouldn't do that because if you think about it, you know, hummingbirds go to these flowers and it's easier for them to fly around higher than it is to go low on the ground where they're more vulnerable. 
irrigation, over irrigation can cause rot. Irrigation that's overhead, you know, like you, you've got a sprinkler and then your shrub grows, but you never do anything about that sprinkler head. And now you hike it up to make it go higher to reach the plant. And then when you overhead spray on plants, especially if you don't do it at the right time, which should be, you know, uh, early morning um, till I think there's even right, there's ordinances about that. But you, if you do water early in the morning with that overhead spray, it gives it time to dry off. But overhead spraying can still have water lingering on the leaves causing um, or attracting uh, fungus. And so there's so many different things when your plant grows and um, your landscaping changes, you move things around, pick out a plant, put in a new one. You need to be concerned about if you've got an irrigation system, things that you can do. You might be able to cut off a zone, just turn it off in a particular area that you've planted. And once they're established, you don't need to irrigate it anymore, just as needed. Or you might use that irrigation head and convert it to drip. Or you might just go ahead and cap it. You don't need it, but maybe you'll be re-landscaping later and you know, you'll keep the, the head there just in case you do something and need it, and need it later. Um, you can uh, redirect, make sure you uh, regularly check your irrigation to make sure that it's redirected in the same way. Um, you know that um, lawnmowers and people and maybe roots have uh, changed, uh, uh, changed it or something's happened and you need to, to readjust that. You might even relocate uh, an irrigation head. I've done that as, you know, when I had a... Um, a flower bed, we use the irrigation, but then I read, let my, as I mentioned, increase the flower bed and decrease the lawn. So my husband redirected, you know, he dug a line and moved that head out to where the grass is and not uh, inside the bed where it's not needed. Um, you, it's helpful to have a sketch here. Um, I've used this, but it doesn't, you don't have to use your um, plot survey. You can uh, just draw something up very simple, but you can see little numbers on there. Those are the different zones and it will change. So you have to update it and keep it uh, current. Don't erase where the, the head is unless you're going to be um, just taking it out because you might, you know, like, like if you've capped one, you might put a little C on it for cap. Um, then you know where at least it is if you're going to um, use it again. So IPM, I don't know if you've heard this term before. Sometimes people use a, a lot of different terms for this, but um, it's called integrated pest management. And what you're doing is you're managing the pests by integrating different steps. And the first step um, to, in this process to identifying pests and diseases is to um, go by uh, increasingly um, managed steps. The first one is to monitor. You know, like I said, go out and wander around your yard, look for different things, doesn't have to be, you know, looking at everything, but just make sure you're keeping an eye on something before you go out there and you go, oh my gosh, what happened to this plant? It's covered with this pest or, oh, why did my plant die? At least you've got a clue that something's going on. And then you can take the next step, which is least, um, the least toxic, which would be manual control. And manual control can mean like, are there just a few leaves with this? Um, can I pinch off these diseased le uh, leaves and so it doesn't spread uh, and there won't be a problem? 
Uh, can I prune off a stem or a branch, get rid of what's infested? Um, and then I would go to the uh, next level, which would be a safer chemical, meaning um, maybe you can control it with, um, you know, a soap solution, horticulture oil, diatomaceous earth. Um, but first you have to identify what the problem is. And, you know, these diseases, it may look like it's very simple to identify, but it's not really. There could be a lot of overlaying other uh, conditions that cause the problem. For example, fungal. Maybe you've got an overhead spray or you're watering right the wrong kind of day. And um, it's in the shade now, so the water stays on the leaves. Well, that can be cured by changing your irrigation and making sure that it's not staying, the wet, the water is not staying on there. Now, if you've done all you can and all your detective work to identify what the disease is and you're just coming up with not a good solution, um, you can always take samples to your county extension office and talk to a master gardener. Um, again, I do want you to be an informed consumer, recognizing that there are new master gardeners and some master gardeners that are very experienced and knowledgeable, but certainly go to them as um, an alternative. Insects, we've got um, two different kinds here. We've got your, um, well, first of all, let me say that 80% of all wildlife are insects, 80%. So you know you're not gonna, you know we're not gonna get rid of them. Uh, we can only try and control them or reduce them, that kind of thing. And again, remember, if it's um, not too much, there's just a little bit around, they're not causing a lot of problems. 95% um, of North American songbirds require insects to feed on during some part of their life. It might be during migration when they need a lot of energy. They drop down into your yard. They need to gobble up those insects for protein so they can, they can go on the next leg of their migration. Also birds that are nesting and have baby birds to feed, they also need the protein, the insects. So that's what the parents will feed them. And they can help, again, kind of reduce um, those pests in your yard. Now the sucking insects, um, they have mandible, no, excuse me, they have the little tube, you know, like a, um, a butterfly does, a little uh, uh, sucking proboscis. And you can see, see here where that it, they pierced into, uh, what they're doing is they're going inside and feeding on the liquid. They're not chewing on the top there. They're going inside and feeding on the liquid inside uh, the tissues. And this can cause little spots or stippling, uh, distortions, curling, puckering. So all kinds of, this is only showing you one um, example of what it looks like. Like I said, this is not easy. Um, it's, it's giving you some uh, basic concepts of how this works. The uh, chewing and rasping, this should be pretty obvious. They have the mandibles that will actually be eating um, the leaf tissue on the outside. And um, it can look ragged, it can look chewed, you can have missing parts. They can actually be rolled up in the leaf. They can make tunnels, you know, like um, leaf miners or you can have girdled stems like, um, you know, like a lot of times you've got a little stem that keeps falling off your trees or maybe your shrubs, uh, some leaves are falling down. That could be uh, an insect. So identifying accurately is the number one step here. Make sure you know which insect it is. Is it, a, is it gonna be, um, a scale? Is it a, what kind of insect is it? 
and then determine what your tolerance level is. Um, can you tolerate 100%? You don't care if your plants are covered. Um, are you tolerant of them if you've got five or six? And you can control it manually, the next selection, by maybe pinching or cutting off a stem. Um, can you tolerate maybe 30% uh, on your plant? You know, that's up to you when you start moving on to the next level of, of treatment. So these are some of, as I said, it's a little bit more complicated than, than what I've shown you. So you can also have some non-living um, uh, um, causes for uh, your plant uh, disease or pests. One of them might be, as I mentioned, uh, watering, overwatering. Uh, one of them could be um, not enough light. You know, sometimes not enough light if, if the plant needs it can result in a plant being kind of lanky, sparse. Um, the flowers may be reduced or delayed flowering, or maybe they don't flower at all. Maybe it's just not getting enough light. Um, you can have over, uh, over, uh, how do you say chemical chemical uh, damage by over fertilizing if you fertilize um, anything like that can can be a cause in addition to some of these overlay each other so it can be difficult to kind of narrow down and tease out uh, what the problem is um, mulch mulch is um, really important and did I skip one? Yep, okay. So mulch, um, I think we all know about mulch and we do not recommend cypress mulch because the possibility that it might be um, um, taken out of our natural areas. We certainly don't wanna lose um, our cypress that takes so, so long to grow. And um, these are some of the ones you use. We are, um, you do want to use only organic, organic mulches, ones that decompose. Because if you see at the top, that's their purpose. You know, some people don't want to keep replenishing, replenishing, replenishing. Well, if you, for example, you could go around your neighborhood when the oak tree's leaf falls and go get their leaves and just put it on the top. Um, so a couple of times a year, you can use the oak leaves. Some people like uh, pine needle leaves. Um, when they fall, they can get them from neighbors. Um, but the purpose is to decompose, um, not only to uh, reduce water loss and moderate soil temperature, because that decomposition goes back into the soil, providing soil nutrients. And that's what... Um, is broken down by all these different, all these different organisms, microorganisms that are in your soil. It's important to have bacteria. If you take a, um, a, a teaspoonful of healthy soil, you should have between a hundred million and one billion bacteria in there. And there's all different kinds, um, so many different species. But what they do is they decompose and they also convert the nitrogen in the air. Remember the air, there's air in the uh, pockets, there's air pockets within the soil to hold water and to hold uh, the uh, air. So they change the nitrogen that's in the air that can be used to a nitrogen that the plant uses to be used by the plant. And these bacteria kind of have a kind of hover around the root zone. So they're helpful there. Fungi, if you had a teaspoon of that healthy soil, you should have probably about 4 million fungi, different kinds in there. Most of them are decomposers again. And the mycorrhizae, which um, colonize on the roots, 
um, they can help um, draw off the water molecules off soil parts. You know how tiny all this is. This is very, very tiny. So they're helping the plant by drawing off the water molecules and making it easier, more available to the plant. Nematodes are round worms. They don't have segments in them. They're round worms. Uh, very, very tiny, a lot of them microscopic. And they have evolved with our native plants, just like a lot of what's above ground has um, evolved with our native plants. Earthworms are the ones that are segmented. And again, they help um, with soil structure um, by tunneling through. They can open up areas where there's oxygen and water. And again, by eating the soil, they actually eat soil, which has got bacteria, fungi, nematodes, all this stuff. And then at the other end of the worm, they poop it out again, which is finer uh, recycled material available for the plants. And um, insects, again, have the, the same effect. They can um, restructure the, uh, the structure of, of the, the soil and by um, having you know, holes or they can bring soil up from, from below to the surface, you know, like um, harvester ants. Uh, they're kind of like recycling the, the soil from lower areas to, to the surface. And then uh, we have moles and armadillos. Sometimes we don't like them, but um, they are predators uh, for us. So, Native wildlife. This is the last, this is our last subject here. And why am I bringing up wildlife? I've sort of alluded to it uh, by saying that uh, they help us with maintenance. Um, wildlife are insects, wildlife are pollinators, wildlife are birds, wildlife are, are moles. All these are important to help you maintain uh, your yard. Um, one of the uh, important aspects of, of uh, uh, having wildlife in your yard is to help mediate the loss of development that we see around us so much lately. Um, this development can be roadblocks to movement and migrations. And um, how we maintain our yards matters. Choices that we make matters for the survival of our wildlife. And they help by, um, a, uh, by attracting predator insects. It attracts more birds with plant diversity. You can keep them in your yard helping you by providing shelter and the different kinds of, of shrubs for nests. And then they'll be more likely to stay with you. Some other things you can do is put in a little uh, rock pile. And, you know, quite frankly, I never thought about this before, but I'm going to do this. I really like it. You can make it look messy um, and make sure it's got open spaces for little anoles to run in and out of. It can, you want different shapes and sizes. You can put plants around it. Uh, to make it look a little bit more tractor and provide more shelter for whoever's going to go in there. The brush pile down below, uh, you're probably familiar with this too. You want to start with larger branches on the bottom and then uh, increase the different layers. Have it at least two to three feet tall, maybe three to ten feet. I wouldn't go that big. Um, you might not have the space. But again, you want it more open uh, for any um, nesting wildlife that might use it. Up at the top, if you can leave some bare spaces, um, this is a native bee. And um, there are 300 native bees within Florida. Most of them are solitary. This one bee just goes in there, lays her eggs in that one hole. Most of them are um, underground. Most of them do not sting except for the bumblebee and some sweat bees. But you know that 
you're not afraid of bumblebees chasing after you. They just sort of bumble along. And most of these native bees live within an area of only 300 yards, which is about half the size of a tennis court. That's their world. Um, so if you can leave a bare spot for them, that would be good. And um, also we've got native bees that don't live under the ground, but they live in hollow stems. So again, I mentioned, you know, watching out for uh, pruning shrubs. If you've got a shrub that has hollow stems, there might be a nesting bee in there. Um, here are some uh, good insects for you. The, the, I guess you would call them predatory or beneficial insects. My favorite is on the top left, the assassin bug. You, uh, there's several, several varieties of these. Um, in Florida, most of them are the orange and black, but you can tell them because they have this pinched neck, this tiny little neck and then a pear-shaped head. And then there are proboscises for sucking out li liquid liquids from their prey. Um, they have hairy legs, so they, they grab their prey. This is a stink bug. And then they take their proboscis and they stick it in, stick it in their prey and suck all the liquids out. And then the insect dies. Um, but they, the, a lot of these look a lot different, but they kind of have this basic characteristic features on their bodies. Below is a really special one. This is green lacewing. And um, I was so in awe when I've seen this only once. Um, I was under a bush and I saw these little eggs hanging, well, eggs hanging down and I knew they belonged to somebody, uh, green, la green lace wings. And they're voracious eaters. So when they, they, they're just, the mom lays them on a little silk thread and hangs the eggs there. When they hatch, they are voracious. This is the part, not the adult, but the larva. This is what the larva looks like after it hatches. Um, so again, proper ID, um, it's feeding on aphids. These things are amazing. They will eat anything. Um, they can eat aphids, thrips. Um, uh, aphids, thrips, oh my gosh, they, they just eat everything. And um, let's see, so I guess, let me go. Oh, and the wood, um, yellow, um, red headed woodpecker, you can see its little, I hope you can see its tongue. They have long tongues um, sticking out. It's gleaning insects from underneath the bark. So they'll help you with maintenance too. Oops, wrong way. Um, okay, again, when you're pruning, please watch out where you're uh, going with those pruners. Um, you can see on the bottom left, can you see there's a bird in there? This is, um, this is the uh, coral honeysuckle. And there's a mockingbird in there. Up on the right is Virginia creeper. And there's a brown thrasher nesting in there. That one is really hidden. Up on the left, you want to use uh, leaf litter, uh, dead leaves, as I mentioned, um, because insects can be in there. And a lot of birds uh, actually are ground feeders, such as the brown thrasher. Can you see what's in here? Can, can you identify what might be in here? I wish I could, I wish I could talk to you directly. It's a luna moth. It's the larva of a luna moth. If you can find out, my pointer doesn't work. It's in the middle, it looks like a airplane or something with wide wings. But what they do is the luna moth, uh, it's five, has four to five instars, which means the caterpillar grows and sheds its skin five times. It drops down into the leaf litter and there it spins silk, a silk thread to tie leaves around itself so it can camouflage itself before emerging as a moth, the luna moth. Isn't that amazing? 
I love that story. Um, and then down on the right is some more of that uh, Elliot's Lovecraft seeds for birds and great hiding places for insects. So to recap, um, I've given you some suggestions for prevention, thinking ahead, for um, pests and diseases, how to get out there and monitor and hopefully identify what the problem is so that you can take control before it gets really bad, lessening your maintenance issues, and wildlife that can help you um, in the long run by being predators in your yard. Oh, if you're still there, <laughs> do you have any questions? Melanie? Oh my gosh. Yes, I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Scared I'm, me. <laughs> I'm just trying to um, unmute everyone. Oh, okay. So, if I can. I'm asking everyone to unmute if you have any, see if you have any questions. Well, see Donna and Linda are unmuted. You guys have any questions? I just wanted to say it was an excellent presentation. I really uh, got a lot of great notes and uh, <laughs> information a lot of it um you sort of you, you've heard about pruning correctly and stuff but you know going over the correct pruners that was very helpful just so much really helpful information for you know any gardeners but but uh thank you so much yeah. you know a lot of times you know you people probably are gardeners and and you probably have your own um own suggestions and the what works for you um, so again, this is just, you know, probably going over some of the material that you need and hopefully, like I said, you know, just pick up some other new tips. So thank you very much. And also the fact that um, you talked about how Florida is so different because so many of us have transplanted from other places and, mm -hmm. and, and why you need to leave that, you know, up north, you have to cover the entire route, you know, of a new plant and stuff like uh, that. And here you don't, you know, so yeah. makes a big difference. Yay. <laughs> there was tons of stuff that I found helpful. I really appreciate it because like I said, we just moved here a couple of years ago and I've never really, we came from Wisconsin. I never really wanted to be outside much gardening uh -huh. up there, but down yeah. here, I'm actually enjoying it. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's new to me and, and I'm trying to learn about snakes and stuff and oh, yeah. not be so afraid of everything so that I oh. can enjoy it more, you know, and, yeah. and it's, it's extremely helpful. A lot yes, of work. I, I am, I'm, I'm very, I congratulate you on your adventurousness. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you know, you just discover new things. It's wonderful. A lot of beautiful things down here. Yeah. And, and that's certainly true. One of the uh, advantages I find of doing maintenance is normally I don't look close enough at everything, but when I'm in there, you know, pruning, et cetera, you see all sorts of things oh. that you wouldn't see if you're just casually walking by. Mm -hmm. So yeah. true. So yes. True. I have to tell you the story. It's um, I, I was pulling out grass, okay, and I dig my hand in and I sift through, and I had this soft thing in my hand. I go, oh, I'm, because I was pulling out some rocks or something. So I open up my hand. I go, well, I just put it down. It was all brown, and so I'm digging some more, and sure enough, I got this soft thing, and I, I opened up my hand, and it wasn't moving. I brushed off. It was a toad. Oh, I'm a toad. I'm going, oh my gosh, you poor thing. I must be scaring you. <laughs> I kept squishing it. <laughs> what is this? Do you always oh, wear gloves when you garden? Pardon? Do you no, no, wear gloves? I don't. You know, I get, I just feel things more with my hands. Yeah. They're all not, they're all knobby either. and I, then I don't have nice nails and, but whatever. I just, I just feel closer, you know? 
You don't worry about grabbing a snake? No, I yeah. never had. Usually, if there's a snake and they see you, they usually slide away before, yeah. before you even see them a lot of times. Okay. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't bother me. If you stick your hand under a bush, you know, you might want to, I mean, I don't do it because I'm not afraid, but if you're concerned, I guess you could have a little stick and kind of stomp the air and say, here I come. And just let them know ahead of time. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the one, the one thing you have to watch out for also um, when you're pruning is not only bird's nests, but those wasps. That, oh my gosh. That make, right. you know, make those nests underneath the leaves because often you don't even see them until you grab the branch, <laughs> rile them yeah. up. <laughs> Surprise. And they sting. They do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you, Melody. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've done that. Yeah. I find in general so many of the bees here are, are pretty docile. I mean, I I I have that African blue basil and I'm deadheading mm -hmm. that a lot. And they just they just go about their thing and I'm deadheading mm -hmm. right in the bush they're in and they just are not aggressive at all. Mm -hmm. That's what I was saying. Food. You know, there are native bees and some of them look like little, they'll be tiny or they'll be big, they'll be different colors. Um, some look like uh, flies, but yeah, they're just, they're solitary. They don't have stingers. They just ignore you. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, what a treat. Yeah. Up north, the bees follow you around because there's not as much plants and stuff. Ah. So they tend to, if, if you're sweaty or if you have perfume oh. on, I never wore perfume up there anyway. And I, <laughs> anyway, but they, yeah, they follow you. And I got down here and I'm like, huh, they're minding their own business, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's a good thing. They're too busy doing their job. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it was interesting. I, I, um, this time of year, I go to blueberry you pick places. Oh, uh huh. And one. <laughs> And one of the ones that I went to, um, they have beehives, you know, with honeybees. Oh. Oh. But they said that, that, that this year they imported native bees because the native bees work a lot harder than the honeybees. Yes. Um, so in order to pollinate their blueberry bushes, they're using native bees now. Mm-hmm. Great. So yeah. There's was... a, a one of the ones that pollinates is actually called blueberry bee. That's its name, oh, wow. blueberry bee. That's what it feeds on or nectars on. Yeah. So so that's cool. Well, any, any other questions? Well, thank you, Nina, and thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you.